Great. All right. So um, please be seated again. So uh, next, I'd like to introduce Todd Nightingale. So Todd is the Senior Vice President and General Manager for Meraki. Uh, he comes from MIT as well back in the day. Uh, and what's interesting is how he's continuously managed to um, evolve the Meraki portfolio. So starting from cloud-managed wireless to cloud-managed networking to cloud-managed IT, expanding into uh, uh, voice and video, telephony. So he's constantly been re, uh, renewing his business over and over again. And he's been a great partner as we've uh, brought Meraki into Cisco and bringing the APIs to developers through all of you. So let's learn from Todd. Thank you, so Todd. Much. Thanks so much. I'm honored. I'm honored to be on the stage of the first dedicated DevNet Create. Um, I was talking to the DevNet team. I was talking to the DevNet team yesterday, and I and I mentioned, you know, it's important that we don't see this event as like the culmination of everything that's been going on, and that this is this is it. We've arrived. This is the beginning. Five years from now, we're all going to be watching the superstructure get torn down at the end of DevNet Create 2022, and we're going to be saying, I was there at the first <laughs> DevNet. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about today, today about sort of uh, what our strategy is like at Meraki and sort of what we're trying to do, uh, what we're trying to do for your guys uh, and your teams uh, out there around the world. Um, Probably many of you have uh, seen the Meraki mission, it, which is to simplify powerful technology so passionate people can focus on their own mission. And for a lot of years, um, we kind of focused on this concept of simplifying management and monitoring of IT so passionate like CIOs could keep their networks up easily and, and get back to IT for education or IT for hospitality and hotels, IT for retail, whatever that might be. Um, but for the last 18 months, we've really kind of expanded that mission, right? To make powerful technology, powerful infrastructure that, like Cisco, that we're, we're good at making, simple for your teams to build on top of, right? So that you can go pursue your mission in the easiest possible way. Um, and we'll talk more about it, but uh, I, I think something that's always held us back in, in this industry and like in the infrastructure industry is, man, it is hard to code on top of 4,000 distributed networking devices at 150 different sites that don't have good interfaces and don't have one place to query them. I, uh, and I've tried. Um, I, I, there was one time in my life I actually got paid real money to write software that, that shipped. Uh, my CTO doesn't believe that anymore. I think he's here. But, um, but this is... Uh, like, this is a real problem and has been for a long time, right? And when you really want to digitize an entire environment and you want to make your business run, you need to automate all the different parts of it. And if it's super hard to build on top of the networking infrastructure, which in a lot of ways is kind of the core, you're going to a lot of times hit a bump the first, very first thing you try and do. So, so this is our mission, and, and, and we focus on it um, quite a bit. And, and and when we think about how we build products at Meraki, we have a whole host of different kinds of principles that we try to think about and, and stay uh, top of mind as we build these things, right? And, uh, and of course, staying mission focused is a big part of that, right? Simplifying powerful technology so people can focus on their own mission. But there's a whole host of other things. Um, and, I, and, I, and these are just a couple of the ones I wanted to talk about today. Experiment and, and don't guess. We'll, we'll save that one for the end. Um, focusing on the customer and not the competition, that is really key. In fact, I was in an ops review the other day, and one of my product managers read me a quote, and I wish I remembered who it was from. And it said, don't fight with your competition. Date your customer. I love that. I want my product teams, I want my engineers to romance the customer. You know, and. Um, and that's really been the story of Meraki, right? Which is, as soon as we started uh, building enterprise equipment, it was the customers who said, hey, wireless is great, but I have a whole network. Once we were really building cloud-managed networking, it was the customers that said, hey, now that my network is simple, 
I'm like a third of the way there. My whole IT infrastructure is still left uh, in, in sort of legacy mode. And, and, and they have directed us along the way. Um, but really, if when we listen to the customer and we hear what they're saying, it's not the bottom of this uh, slide that matters. Uh, whether it's switching or wireless, routing, security, all that stuff, it's how people access it that changes the game, right? And this, this dashboard solution, cloud management, that's been our play, right? Cloud management for network infrastructure, for IT infrastructure. And we believe we've really made something truly simple, right? But as we listen to the customer base, it just is not enough, right? For a long time, in order to stay on this track of simplicity, we thought about this concept of the 80-20 rule. And I've had a hard time explaining this to many Cisco execs in my uh, time here, but um, I think this is an audience that can appreciate this. We want to build a product, or, or in the past, we wanted to build a product that was the complete solution for 80% of the customers. Right? It's not like 80% of the solution. It's the complete solution for 80% of the customers. But there's always going to be that 20% that needs some crazy thing. And this was like our wild card. This was our like trump card to say, well, we're not going to build that. You're one of the 20%. So that thing is off the table. And back in the day, we used to sort of have to disqualify. I was the guy who taught our sales teams that it was OK to disqualify yourself from a deal because that customer was one of the 20%, and we should walk away from that deal. And it was about two years ago when we started to realize, like, that's the wrong play. Because the 80-20 rule is sort of coming back to haunt us. Right? If we just try to build the mainstream features for 80% of the customers and leave out the 20%, the first of all, many customers want to be that 20%. Maybe not today, and maybe not tomorrow, but they want to see that future of being able to leverage all the power of the infrastructure, and very importantly, all the power of the data that's coming off of their locations. And they want to know that they're going to be able to move in that direction later. right? And so if we open up the platform in just the right way, and we provide these APIs that allow teams like yours to build applications on top of them, then we no longer have to neglect the 20%. 80% right? of the customers, great. They use our platform, and it's sufficient today. 20% even today, they're, they're going to go with an uh, expanded solution that we can build, that we can build together in this team and, and in the Meraki dev team. Um, and that, I felt like that was working for a while. Right? And as we started opening up the APIs more and more and, and trying to figure out what the best way and easiest to program platform could be, it, this momentum started to build. And to be honest, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a rocket ship right off the start. Uh, but about nine months ago, it started really taking off, uh, in usage at least, at least in usage. The reality is, I think what we see now is the 80-20 rule is, is starting to fade. And it's not 80% of the customers are going to use our base solution, and 20% are going to expand with extra applications and services on top. The 80-20 rule is becoming the 70-30 rule. It's becoming the 60-40 rule. And as companies and schools and businesses start to realize that they can get so much more out of what they used to think of as just plumbing, of just infrastructure. Right? They can get so much more of that, why wouldn't they? Right? Your teams have become successful in making it easy for them to get so much more value out that it's no longer the 80-20 rule. This API strategy, this concept of opening up the platform, it's part and parcel to almost every significant deal we do. Right? And that has sort of driven our growth and hopefully your growth over the last year. The, um, the platform uh, concept is just this idea, the, the mission of making it as easy as possible for your teams to develop on top of powerful network infrastructure, powerful IT infrastructure. Right? Uh, I used to live in a world where if you wanted to query a uh, thousand access points, and they were spread out all over the country. No worries, you would like open up tunnels to each site and like SNMP query each one and get your data. I got really good at SNMP walking. Anybody use the SNMP walk? You all have. Everyone here has. It's a horrible experience. Um, the the reality is, if look, if we want to make this 
if we're serious about this and we want to make it real, we've got to stop that. Like SNMP was invented way back when. There has to be a better way. There has to be a modern way. And, and we believe this is the way, right? The same cloud management technology that we use is for IT managers to be able to use a dashboard. We can use that for IT programmers to build apps on top of, right? So that you can go to one cloud interface, one REST API, and you can access all of the technology, whether it be wireless or cameras, whether it's switching, routing, security, all of that stuff. And that one cloud, of course, it does provide our, our regular dashboard, but how we open up this API, what the right blue arrow looks like, sort of that's the key to how we can work together. And if we can get it right, like hopefully, we can make your teams more powerful uh, with every step of the way, right? And this is sort of how we've started, right? So the first thing that we did was an automation API. Wait, I might be out of order. I don't know if it's the first, but it was right up there. It was right up there. Um, and this is this idea, we call it dashboard API at Meraki, right? And this is, hey, if you want to manage and configure this stuff, this is, this is how you do it. And tons of customers um, have already started using this. I want to, I want to deploy uh, 25 Meraki access points at like my corporate headquarters. Okay, I don't need this. Like 25, no worries. I can configure 25 things in a web interface, no worries. I want to deploy 25,000 APs all over Mexico. Like, I don't want to click anything 25,000 times. And aut being able to automate that with a REST API to one cloud interface uh, and program not just the basic configuration, but templates and configuration and provisioning, all that stuff. Super, super powerful. And we've seen awesome uh, uptick in this. Uh, next one is this concept of scanning. So um, in some ways, you can think of the dashboard API as making our regular network operations more efficient. right? But scanning API isn't really about that. Right? It's about understanding the location where the equipment is deployed. Right? We're all walking around with iPhones that are bleeding information at all times, whether we like it or not. You have to try pretty hard to get it to stop. And um, you know, retailers and hosp hospitals and hotels, they want to know who's in the environment. Have they been here recently? How long do they stay? Is this hotel manager better than that hotel manager keeping people in the bar area? I swear I saw that application being built. Um, and, and that's what this API is about, right? So it, what we found as we built it was kind of interesting. Like we thought it would sort of go like this. OK, we have built-in location tracking, and that's good. And um, our locationing algorithms are what they are, and like, we think they're great. But we're going to have some people who don't believe in our location algorithms. They're going to want the raw data, and they're going to do their own locationing algorithms. And maybe they'll mix our data with video camera data, or they'll mix our data with gyroscope data from the devices, and they'll do even better. That'll be great. And it turns out um, like one size does not fit all. Right? We released our raw data uh, into the API, and that helped some of the people. Then we got a lot of requests, hey, I don't want the raw data. You just give me your location, whatever you calculated, and we'll work from there. And we added that. And then most recently added Bluetooth as well. And so all of these things making it better and better, easier and easier to scan for devices in the environment and even track them through the environment. Um, the, the last one, and I guess this might have even been the very first one uh, we ever implemented, was Captive Portal. Right? Captive Portal, for people who aren't Wi-Fi uh, users, that's what happens on your iPhone when you try to connect to the Wi-Fi in your hotel and it like asks you for your name and stuff. That's Captive Portal. You have, you've been captivated. Um, Captured, I guess is the word. And the, um, it's interesting because the, how, you inter how you operate with that captive portal it has been done by like every Wi-Fi vendor in the world. And everyone does it a little differently. And exactly how you do it and how you operate with the developers who are building the, uh, the captive portal, the like, web presence that uh, people click through to get on the Wi-Fi, it changes the usability. And to be honest, you have to chase it. As Android like, keeps changing how they get people on Wi-Fi, the captive portal has to change. And sometimes even the API has to update. And so you have to chase this thing down. right? That's another reason why this community is such an important one, is that as devices change and networks change, these APIs will not, not be able to be static 100% uh, of the time. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about 
these APIs, but also how they're being used uh, in the environment. What we've seen is there's sort of two camps. There's a group of customers who take the APIs and they build on top of them all sorts of different things. And that's a, um, a set of very large customers, usually. And then there's a, a very large partner community building on top of these APIs and really getting that, um, that value and being able to sell it back into the customer base uh, with us. Right? And I want to talk a little bit about the customer side, because it, it is interesting uh, what they do. This is a uh, top 10 uh, retailer in the US. And uh, they deployed thousands of Meraki devices. We went with Acme Corporation to preserve the confidentiality. Retailers are very sensitive. But um, they had an interesting play, right? So they wanted to roll up, they wanted to uh, deploy out 1,800 sites all over, their, uh, all over the country. And they have a problem that their sites are like, they don't have people at every site. They have third parties rolling stuff out and doing all sorts of uh, different sets of IT uh, at each site. And it's super painful for them, right? So they didn't want to click anything 1,800 times. So they, s they made a very easy dashboard AP set of dashboard API calls, really like less than 20 lines of code. And they were able to provision up, like set up 1,800 networks, which was pretty cool, I thought. But um, it turns out that was, like, that was just to get started. What they really needed was a special kind of interface that's just for these third-party installers that looks kind of like this. And it just gives this very, very precise uh, web experience for installers. That, so they only have to do these two things. Those are the only things they can see. There's nothing else on the page. This is the kind of project we would never build like at, at Cisco. It's like, hey, this is just a super custom interface for installers that are going to do exactly one thing. Probably after these 1,800 sites are, gone, are built, they're going like, to get rid of this. And there's not going to be a thing, right? But they were able to build this app, plug it into the API, and then watch, basically watch on their dashboard as the sites just came online, because the, the integrators all over the world were installing the stuff, scan the serial number, click OK on the app, and off to the races. Right? It was like super, super simple. Um, and they actually wound up saving so much time building this stuff out uh, and, and setting up their network that they were able to uh, invest the rest of that time in some really awesome uh, dashboard work, into some really awesome dashboard work. PowerPoint isn't responding right now. It's not the best. <laughs> there we go. Really awesome, uh, really awesome dashboard work. They use the Datadog infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, play through, play through. Um, they use Datadog infrastructure, and they were able to build like uh, really cool dashboarding that shows how the sites are coming online. Um, and you can even see the historical count here. This upper right kind of heat map looking thing is showing how many clients are actually online and how much data they're. Uh, they're uh, generating over time. Right? And this is the kind of thing that's built just for them. It's very uh, specific for their business. They were able to build this in because they really saved a ton of uh, resources in the build out. Right? Um, I think that's a good example of the, of the customer side. Um, but I think the, to be honest, the, the, the most sophisticated apps we've seen so far, for the most part, are being built by, by partners. Right? I know we have a, a bunch of partners in the room today who are building uh, different types of applications of cloud services all on top of these APIs. And I've been incredibly impressed uh, with the progress so far. Um, here's one. Subway. Uh, this is Subway in Canada, actually. Canadian subways. They're lovely. Um, and they've got an awesome, uh, they had an awesome kind of initiative. Their play was what they call like cross-selling uh, or ba increased basket size, right? I'm not too good for Subway. I, I love a good Italian sub uh, at Subway. They bake their own bread. It's delicious. But I've never bought soup at Subway, and probably neither has anyone here. Um, and, but, that, but that's the concept here, right? It's like, hey, if we can get people who are coming in for a sandwich to buy a soup, then like, the business is going to be that much, uh, that much more successful. And they really drove this program through an app um, that they built out, the, their Subway app, running analytics using the Wi-Fi, and then noticing what the buying behaviors were and like what kind of offers they had to push to get people to buy soup. Like the people who buy soup, do they always stay at the subway or do they leave, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what they found out was sort of interesting, right? It wasn't 
the, the cross-sell to soup maybe wasn't the most important thing in the business. What they did find out is people who opted in to use the Wi-Fi and use the app, they were way more likely to come back, right? Maybe Subway is, turns out, it's like less of a sandwich grab-and-go shop and more of a cafe where if you like get engaged and you're online and using the app that you want to stay. If you spend 25 minutes in Subway, you're way more likely to buy soup, I bet, but I don't know. Um, it's, not my, it's not my specialty. Um, uh, another one that I, I'm personally really proud of is this work we do in Mexico. It's called Mexico Conectado. It's a huge deployment all over Mexico at federal buildings all over the country. And um, this was an interesting partnership. We worked with Splunk. There was also a Mexican development team within Cisco. And they worked uh, closely on building really advanced dashboarding specifically geared toward this deployment. Uh, a lot of this deployment was geared specifically at reaching people who'd never really had reasonable internet access before in rural buildings all over, uh, all over Mexico. Uh, 22,000 sites was the, first, was the very first rollout. Um, and they built a, a pretty great dashboard. It was really to read up to, um, to be able to be read up to the, uh, to the government officials that were investing in this and showing how the different sites were being used. Uh, it was a very, very complicated deployment. In fact, there were like a dozen different service providers all bringing up and monitoring uh, different parts of it. You know, one service provider had 1,000 sites, the other guy had 4,000, 2,000 here. And to be able to see that all in one dashboard and be able to understand where their bandwidth was going and how things were operating on their network, how many of their sites were up, they could even see which of their service providers wasn't performing. Like, oh, this service provider, they only wind up getting their sites up and running and actually being used in like city, you know, uh, metropolitan areas, and the rural areas are being neglected, which is very common because it's uh, super hard to get good bandwidth out to the rural areas. Uh, they also got really interesting information about how Mexicans used their free Wi-Fi uh, around the country. Like it turned out, and I thought this was interesting, like YouTube is killing it in Mexico. Like that's awesome. And, uh, and Facebook too, in fact. Uh, but like Netflix, there's almost no penetration in Mexico. Like, and Netflix usually uses all the bandwidth. They're like the bandwidth hog of the internet, but like that's not true uh, in Mexico. And like, it, I think this shows the kind of opportunity that they have after they are able to make sure that all the sites are getting good Wi-Fi and that they are serving uh, both the privileged urban communities and also the uh, rural communities that might have a harder time, they'll be able to do deeper levels of analytics, understand how, what's really happening on this network and maybe how they could help people uh, use it better over time. Um, there's an interesting uh, use of the APIs I wanted to talk about for a minute. So um, at Meraki, we were acquired by Cisco about four years ago. And I'm hoping that this will be the first event I ever attend where I'm not asked when are we going to merge the Cisco and the Meraki equipment? Uh, and I think it might be. It hasn't happened yet. I'm super excited. Um, we're, not, we're, we're, not, we're not merging it. We're not merging it. Um, but within Cisco right now, maybe the hottest topic is how do we let our customers manage and monitor this equipment from one single place? How do we get visibility into this infrastructure if you happen to have like Cisco at the core and Meraki at your stores or Meraki at your branches or whatever it happens to be. Meraki wireless, Cisco core. We got great aggregation switches you should try out, but anyway, all that stuff. Um, it's like the hottest topic. I, I, I take meetings on it all the time and different possibilities and proposals. And we're using the APIs right now to allow these applications to be built, right? To allow like a network automation or better IT automation system to be built where Cisco infrastructure all across uh, different business units, different parts of the network can be managed by one place. Maybe it's not just networking. Maybe it's all the campus networking, whether you're Meraki or the traditional stuff. Maybe it also is for data center, maybe the collaboration and IoT. All the different systems from Cisco could be managed by a single place. Maybe beyond Cisco. Maybe it doesn't matter what kind of gear you have, Cisco could build an automation system that would be able to manage all that stuff. And I think that's an awesome uh, and powerful goal, right? Just be able to manage your Cisco infrastructure from a single app. And maybe the team that's going to build that app is working at Cisco right now, and they're building it. 
and maybe not. Maybe the person who's going to build that is in this room, right? Because the APIs that we are publishing and developing and working on for this uh, initiative, there is no way that those are going to be some secret private API because we're ne we would never take that risk, right? We'll be opening up any API that we build for these internal functions so that developers around the world can build automation systems, can leverage analytics, and hopefully really listen to the customers in the right way to figure out what that killer set of features is for an MVP in that space that allows you to automate all the different parts of the infrastructure, whether regardless of what vendor you have. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. I, I think there's like a huge step forward here uh, in how this goes and how this gets built out next. Um, We've had huge success, like I said, over the last six months. There's just been this huge surge in use of the API. Uh, we track it pretty carefully um, uh, in our back end. And I really believe this is kind of the future of how we expand into the rest of the world. When we launched Bluetooth, and that wasn't uh, Bluetooth APIs, and that wasn't uh, too long ago, Colin, just a couple months. Like, almost immediately, we saw people tracking Bluetooth devices, 50 million Bluetooth devices in like the first couple of weeks. Like, the speed with which your teams and developers around the world are picking this stuff up is remarkable. Um, and, I, uh, and I do believe this is the future. Like, making IT easy to manage and easy to monitor is not going to be done at Cisco. It's going to be done by gru IT groups and software developer groups from around the world. And that's why we want to make it as easy as possible uh, for you guys uh, to build on top of these APIs and, and to get into this community. Um, so we are uh, giving away a uh, million dollars list price, list value, or whatever that's called, a million dollars of equipment, uh, of Meraki equipment, uh, to developers who get on the system, who uh, start using the APIs. And if you do a mini lab, or if you're remote, you don't have to do a mini lab, you can do a learning lab, then uh, we were, we're going to send you some free gear. Um, so that you can jump in and really, uh, and really build this stuff. I really believe in this idea of experimenting and building, getting your hands on the equipment, getting your hands on the API, and working on it. Um, and that's what I sort of wanted to leave you with, is this idea of um, you know, that process and, and how, to build, uh, how to build great products. Um, my CTO, Brett, he, uh, he He's been telling me for a long time, speed is the ultimate superpower. You know, respect the MVP process. Experiment and do not um, experiment and, and do not guess. Right? When we think about that, a lot of times we think about like, how do you think about how you build uh, great products? And sometimes we think about it like this: um, this concept that you know you're going to start with a concept, and you're going to your your dev team you're going to build uh, that feature set out over time, and then hopefully, eventually, you'll reach a point where you feel like you've got a prototype to show people, and then eventually, uh, your product maturity, your stability reaches this state of, uh, of being really shippable, ready to go for a 1.0 product. Right? And really, the key is this bottom left corner. Right? The key is really to find experts, not just in the technology, but in the market as well, and, and to build kind of a small team that's cross-functional in engineering and product and marketing that can understand the whole problem space and really see what that product is going to look like, not just today or in six months, but what that product has to look like in 18 months or 24 months, right? Because that first stage, the planning on day one, that's most important. And if you get the right group, if you get the right set of experts, you can really plan what that future product will be and what you are going to ship in the future, right? And that is the key to building a product in this sort of straight line thinking. Right? And look at that graph, it's beautiful. <laughs> it is predictable, not just in budget, but in time and resources. As a general manager, I love this graph. My CFO, Kelly Kramer, loves it. Understand when the product is going to be shipped. I can see when I'm going to start making revenue. It's beautiful. But it is total bullshit. <laughs> no product I have ever been a part of has been built like this, and nor should it. Right? 
If you think you can find a group of experts and put them in a room and they're going to know what the product should be like in 18 months, you are not an expert. <laughs> like, no one can do that, right? No one understands enough about the technology and the market and the future customers to make this kind of guess, nor should anyone. Don't guess. Experiment. When, you build, when your teams are out building products, please build them the way Brett and, and our engineering teams do, which is through iteration and experimentation, getting feedback along the way and having the courage to throw out your work and start over. It is a beautiful and freeing exercise. Um, <laughs> And this, this exercise of iteration, this is the journey that we are on too. Like, we are going to be building APIs and opening up our platform for years to come, and we are going to continue to experiment and get feedback from you and understand where to go and where to change direction and, and how to, and, and how to uh, make the platform better. So thank you so much. I appreciate everything. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> that was great. So sharing his uh, years of wisdom, and I wanted to be the first one to say bullshit on stage, but he beat me to it. <laughs> so, um, so fantastic. So we had a great set of uh, keynotes this morning, heard lots of uh, fantastic perspectives. Thank you, Abby, Craig, Todd, for joining us here. Um, thank all of you for coming. What I wanted to do was uh, just take about five minutes here and tell you about the rest of CREATE. Uh, we've actually been planning this for the last few months. We've been very nervous about it. We're very excited that it's here. I'm especially excited that all of you are here. And, um, and then we have a, a great agenda ahead for you. So uh, first of all, uh, 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 many of you know Ken Owens. So Ken Owens has been you know, very active in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Forum. Uh, he's also the DevNet Cloud CTO. So we're very happy that he's joined our team in uh, the last half year. And uh, unfortunately, he can't be here in person. Uh, some unexpected issues arose, but he's busy online, so you'll see him tweeting away. He's in full support here. So uh, also now, I want to bring up Mandy Whaley. Uh, Mandy is my director of developer experience, and she manages our dev evangelists in our DevNet sandbox. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, here at uh, DevNet Create, we have two tracks on IoT and cloud. So uh, Ken was leading our cloud track, Mandy's leading our IoT track, but working across. And she's going to tell us more about what we'll be seeing here for the rest of DevNet Create. Yep. Thanks. So um, what we wanted to spend some time now on is turning back to the focus on the community. So one of the things that we strongly brought to Create when we started planning it was that we wanted to have a strong focus on lessons learned, uh, hands-on experience, workshops from the community, from all of our developers who are working with these technologies. So as we head into the afternoon, we'll, we're going to start into those community tracks. And we have two different tracks, one on IoT and applications, and one that's more on cloud and DevOps. And today you can find topics around apps meet people. You can learn about building bots for the enterprise, working with Amazon Alexa, um, and exploring some new UX paradigms. We've also got a great track on apps meet microservices and deployment. We heard a lot about Kubernetes and multi-cloud and hybrid cloud in some of the keynotes today. You can go and get hands-on with some of those technologies in our workshops and in our classroom. And then you can hear some lessons learned from other people in the industry and the talks in that track. We also have a great session this afternoon on apps meet security. So we had a lot in Susie's talk about security. We've got some of the um, our experts from Talos and Snort are going to be here talking about some security technologies, some security challenges, and some things that you can try out and do. All the talks that are in these tracks, about 90% of them are from the community. And then we have some Cisco speakers joining in as well. So you'll find um, we have over, I think, 95 speakers that are contributing content throughout the conference. So if you see a speaker, you know, give them thanks, give them a hand. We're really excited to have all of the community contributed content. Some of the other things that we have going on, we have our mini hacks. You heard those in several of the different comments from the presenters. This is where you can go get hands-on. We've got challenges that take about 45 minutes to do. 
you can write an application that calls a Spark board. You can connect a um, Jasper device and make an IoT connected water sensor. You can try out Meraki and do some of that location awareness and analytics that we were looking at. So you can go and experience and do those, those hands-on activities here at Create. You can also do them at home. Um, if you're checking in the live stream, we have all the materials in our learning labs, just devnetcreate.io, and you can get hands-on. Um, one other thing that we have, we do have birds of a feather session. So this is a time when you can get together, you can talk with other people who are interested in a topic that you're interested in. We have some of those scheduled. We're also making that space open to you as community members. If you have an idea for a birds of a feather group you'd like to get together, you can talk to the people at registration, say, I'd like to get a group together on this topic, and we'll help promote it and let people know at the conference that you can join on. So we're gonna head out to lunch next, and then all of that content starts this afternoon. And then at the end of the day, we've got some giveaways. We're gonna raffle off the Spark gear, some Jasper IoT kits, um, and we're also gonna have some time for, the, for you guys to get up and talk and tell us about what you saw during the day, different things that you experienced. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> Great. And so, uh, so to clarify, at the end of the day, uh, there's going to be a panel back in this room. So we're going to have the panel session on makers, makers and builders. So it's going to be a very interesting one. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to have the giveaway section and some reflections on the day. And for that, we're going to have the SX10 that Jason Gecki had announced, the uh, video collaboration unit there. Uh, in addition, we're going to have some Meraki gear, as Todd just talked about, and then with Jasper, those cellular connections for IoT are through these IoT kits, so we'll be giving out some of these IoT kits as well. You must be here to win. So, sorry for the folks online. Actually, they can register for some other prizes uh, online by taking the learning labs and things, but for some of the giveaways, you're going to have to be here to win, uh, and we'll have happy hour and beer too. So. Uh, Thank you, everybody. So have a great DevNet Create. Uh, realize it's about you. Please meet as many of my team members. Meet me, meet each other. We want to hear your feedback because this is our first time doing this. We want to make sure that this is the most productive that it can be for all of you and fun, too. Thank you. Take care.